Well, uh, we're joined by Jocelyn, who's going to share her story with us. Jocelyn, go ahead and share your story whenever you're ready. Great, thank you. Today, our baby is the size of a pea. Today, she's the size of a grape. We, like every excited, soon-to-be parent, followed our baby's growth each week with joy and pride. As a mother of mater advanced maternal age, we had a CVS test to, to check for any abnormalities or genetic issues and we're thrilled to learn that we were expecting a baby girl and everything was normal. <laughs> Sorry. Take your time. Take all the time you need. With five nieces at the time, I knew the drill with baby girls and I couldn't wait to dress our little girl in their hand-me-downs. I dreamed of a gaggle of little girls running around my childhood home in Idaho, jumping on the trampoline digging potatoes out of the dirt with grandpa and baking in the kitchen with grandma. We traveled early in the pregnancy to Russia and Norway, and we dreamed of the life we'd have together with our little girl. We explored the neighborhoods I'd lived in in St. Petersburg and Moscow when I was studying abroad, and we visited the towns in Norway where my husband spent his summers growing up. We finally spent a few days in northern Norway tracking the midnight sun, and taking a cruise through the majestic fjords of Norway. It was idyllic in our last trip before the baby was born. She was due on Valentine's Day. Could it be more romantic and perfect? Because my doctor works at a teaching hospital, our pregnancy got a lot more attention than most. We had sonograms every four weeks, and I had no idea this was, norm this was not the norm because that it was my first time and that's how they did it. In retrospect, in another less teachy hospital, we wouldn't have had a sonogram at 16 weeks, but it was standard. The maternal fetal medicine group was across the hall, so we were able to have the sonogram on one side and then meet with my OB on the other. On September 5th, 2012, my husband joined me for our 16-week sonogram. We squeezed each other's hands when we heard her little heart beat and we watched with wonder as the technician measured and commented on each little body part. I'm not sure when she realized, but in retrospect, she grew less cheery and cheery with the announcements and of the length of this and the size of that. And as she left, she said the doctor would be in to talk about a diagnosis. Diagnosis? The wait for the doctor sure felt like a long, long time. Then a doctor we'd never met came in. She had beautiful, long, brown, curly hair. Dr. F sat in an office chair and rolled over to the exam table. She spoke very softly. Our baby was missing an arm bone, the ulna. She was measuring very small, in fact, too small. She had an extreme form of skeletal dysplasia. She was not only going to be a little person, but her lungs would not grow large enough to breathe on her own. Her lungs would not grow large enough. Incompatible with life, they said. How can you argue with that? It seemed so clear, but it took so long for it to sink in. Hours, in fact. We asked if it were possible if she could outgrow it. Could we wait another week? Could Dr. F write down our diagnosis? She said she couldn't be 100% sure, but she suspected that it was thanatophoric dysplasia. She handed me a slip of paper with the words scribbled in blue ink, and we walked out of the office to see my OB. We waited. I didn't know what to do with myself. I sat in shock, hands in my lap, shaking, waiting. An older woman, a complete stranger walked up to me and maybe she took my hand, maybe she didn't, but she looked in my eyes and said, are you okay? I was not only surprised but also touched by her intimacy and her boldness. It may be the only time in my life that a complete stranger walked up to me and asked me if I was okay. I'm sure it was written on my face, but I thought I was holding it together. And I know I wasn't crying. How did she know? For the rest of our wait, I just focused on trying to look OK and trying not to make anyone else feel uncomfortable. 
trying to be invisible. I've learned that in crisis, I don't cry. I just shut down emotionally. I compartmentalize it and wait for more information. I put it in a box on this seat next to me and wait until I know exactly what it is. We sat with my doctor and had an awkward conversation about options. She knew where this conversation was going, where it had to go. I asked if we could wait a week to see if she could miraculously outgrow this diagnosis. Now that seems so silly. I asked if our insurance would cover it if we decided to terminate the pregnancy. I asked if it was legal to have a, an abortion at 17 or 18 weeks in the state of New York. How long would it take? What would happen? Would it hurt? The word abortion is so politically charged that it took me a long time to be able to, to call it an abortion. I've always been pro-choice. I, I believe that a woman has the right to abort a pregnancy. Even so, inside I knew and I thought, and I probably said to myself so many times, but personally, I would never have an abortion. What hubris, what foolishness, what a lesson I had to learn. We finally left her office and tried not to make eye contact with anyone on our way home. We rode the subway looking at the floor, holding hands in silence. We couldn't wait to be in a private place where we could pull out that slip of paper and figure out what we were even talking about. I received a voicemail from our geneticist who implored us not to Google anything and to come in as soon as possible. I called and made an appointment with her for the next day and then we settled in with our laptop. There was one documented case of a child surviving until eight years old with thanatophoric dysplasia. Incompatible with life. Thanatos, the Greek god, is the personification of death. Every link echoed what we were slowly realizing. There was no way we could continue the pregnancy. <laughs> if our baby even survived to term, she would live in uncontrollable pain. She would live only a few hours and with extreme intervention. We looked at each other and we knew. We had no choice. We had to protect her from life. Her body wasn't able to live outside my body, and we had to care for her the best that we could. And it meant the unthinkable. The geneticist exuded warmth and understanding. She said it was okay if we cried. We wanted to know what could cause this, how, who, was there anything that could be learned from our experience? Could research from our loss help others? What really does our baby have? Is it likely to happen in another pregnancy? What are our chances of having a normal pregnancy after this one? Could we try again? I called my mom and I remember asking, are you at work? How does one explain? She said she was standing, washing dishes. I blurted it out. Mom, it's not a viable pregnancy. Those words meant everything, but they also explained nothing. I don't remember the rest of the conversation. She was on a plane out of Idaho Falls within a few hours. She held me in my bed as I wept. Every morning I woke, if I had slept at all, from the worst nightmare I'd ever experienced. They say that intense grief can cause physical pain. It felt like a brick on my chest. Crumpled tissues piled higher and higher on the floor beside my bed. I cried until my tears were dry and my face hurt. We went for a long walk. We went out for a nice lunch. I don't remember many of the conversations as I told my siblings. Did my mom make those calls? I can't even remember. Several of my friends were traveling at the time, 
Judy and her family were in Canada and she promised to help me track down others and soon had made arrangements to come be by our side. Lori was driving on the Audubon in Germany and she cried with me on the phone. I called others who were at work on a Friday afternoon because I needed to tell them right away. Thankfully, we never made an announcement about the pregnancy on Facebook, so we didn't have to share what was happening in our collapsing world. Anyone outside of our closest circle learned only that we were losing the baby. My doctor wrote a phone number on a slip of paper. That's the currency you use when you're learning about fatal abnormalities and arranging for abortions. Slips of paper with details scrawled in blue ink. Scripts of, strips of paper offering a lifeline. Even in New York City, it seemed hush and clandestine. Graciously, all of our appointments were very early in the morning, well before the hours of regular OB appointments, so we didn't have to face the beautiful, swollen bellies full of promise. I called the phone number and left a message. The doctor didn't call me back until very late, so late I had almost given up and was starting to panic. If we didn't get on the calendar, we'd have to wait another week. My phone rang at about 10.30 at night and he told me the details. Show up at seven in the morning, take some ibuprofen. It'll take two days to prep and then the surgery will be on Friday. Okay, see you then. When the doctor arrived in his office the next morning, he had spilled coffee all over his white jacket. I'd almost given up, I asked and he talked briefly about how it is to be an abortion doctor, the news stories, the threats, the political climate. He did a sonogram to check one last time to make sure there hadn't been a mistake. He turned the screen away from me so that I wouldn't have to face her. I'm sure he did this to protect me. The 10 days between the first sonogram and our termination was a very hard time. I had just unpacked all the maternity clothes that my sisters had sent with such joy upon learning we were pregnant. I needed to get it out of my house as soon as possible. My friend Jill came to help us pack it up and move it back into storage. We went out for margaritas. I worried the bartender would judge me since I was just on the edge of being visibly pregnant. What was I doing sitting at the bar and having a drink? Would they judge or dare ask, whisper about my choices? My colleagues and an old friend sent beautiful flowers. My brother brought us delicious takeout and when he stood weeping, in my dining room, I thoughtlessly asked in earnest why he was so upset. I'll never forget him standing there with tears streaming down his cheeks. I had no space to offer compassion for anyone else's feelings about this loss. It's a moment I'm not particularly proud of. Once our decision was made, it was so hard to have her inside me to still be pregnant. I knew that she was just developing her sense of hearing. <laughs> she could hear me sing songs to her. <laughs> she could hear my husband play the guitar for her. She could hear us plotting her demise. <laughs> I couldn't stop thinking about her, <laughs> hearing our conversations, our deliberations, our pain. Could she understand? Who was she? How could I never meet her? We had a nickname for our baby, but once we knew what we were facing, we couldn't use it. We started referring to her as the pregnancy and the abortion as the termination. Our caregivers took our cue on what language to use. I was given the contact information for a social worker, but at the time I didn't even understand what she would do for us. We never considered a funeral service. We were too overwhelmed with the logistics of getting through the procedure. I sometimes wish now that we had formally named her for our friends and our family so that they would know how to refer to her without having to say the words abortion or termination or refer to her as that pregnancy. 
Maybe if people knew her name, they would think to ask about her. My mom and I call her Aura, and you can too. My husband Tom came the first day of the two-day prep. The doctor inserted lam laminaria, small sticks made of seaweed, into my cervix that would slowly expand the cervix to prepare my body for the D&E that would happen on Friday. It felt like it sounds <laughs> super awful. I went to Duane Reed to fill a script for a painkiller and sat on a bench on Madison Avenue in the crisp, sunny morning, waiting for it to be filled. Then I went to a work meeting. I had convinced myself that I couldn't miss. I had to get up and leave halfway through in a cold sweat. Jill came with me the second day and held my hand as the doctor inserted the second round of the sticks. I'm not sure she realized when she offered to come with me that she'd be holding my hand in the exam room. <laughs> but when the time came, she could see that I needed her. The doctor told me to stop bearing down and pushing, which was my body's natural response to the intrusion. It was nearly impossible to stop the natural reaction to protect itself. We drove to the airport to pick up Judy. We all went out for lunch at diner and we tried to act like everything was normal. But then I threw up the minute we walked in our home. I lay down on the couch with my eyes closed for most of the evening and just listened to them talk, their hushed voices tethering me to the room while I drifted in and out in a haze of pain and medication. The doctor who performed our abortion is like a ghost. Since my abortion, I've been in that office maybe 50 times and I've never, ever seen him again. Of course, it makes sense. These doctors are angels who show up to help women who are living a nightmare. He provided great care, but to be honest, I didn't want to talk to him. I'm so glad for the work that he does, but I had a, a, nice, a hard time sharing niceties with him because I hated that I had to be in that room. And let's be clear, none of us wanted to be in that room. On Friday, September 14th, 2012, a day sandwiched between two of my brother's birthdays, we arrived at the hospital early before the sun even came up. I remember being so glad that this day wouldn't have to be on either of their birthdays. This day would be its own day for me. We had a check-in with a nurse who drilled me over minor unimportant details of my medical history. There was one other couple. None of us spoke or made eye contact as we waited. They called my name to come back first. Judy hugged us and Tom and I were left alone for a few moments. We didn't know what to say to one another. I started wondering about questions we'd never thought to ask. I worried about complications. A D&E is much safer than childbirth, but everything carries risk. Soon they asked Tom to leave, <clears throat> and I was alone. The nurses asked a few last questions, and I signed the paperwork. I'm sure they had to make sure that I hadn't been coerced into having this procedure. The nurses were thoughtful, warm, and kind as they wheeled me into the operating room. I couldn't wait to go to sleep. When I woke, there was a lot of blood, so much blood I could feel it pooling on the bed. It felt like emptiness and openness between my legs. I sucked on a few ice cubes and drank some ginger ale. I felt so much relief, physically and emotionally. It was finally over. We never got a definitive diagnosis. It was a skeletal dysplasia caused by a spontaneous genetic mutation. Our tissue, our pregnancy, our baby was sent to a research hospital for more testing. But when we finally got news back, they said it was a genetic mutation that, not, that had not yet been identified. I'm writing my story in solidarity with others who have suffered unspeakable, heart-wrenching loss. I'm writing this because I'm a woman and I have a voice and a vote. I will not be silenced or shamed by those who believe they have the moral authority to come between a woman, her body, her choice, and her family. Thank you.
Thank you <laughs> so much for sharing your story, Jocelyn. I really appreciate that you know you you shared so much with us, the strangers, and just everyone watching this. And um, you know, you're just so amazing. <laughs> Thank you. I just want to ask you. Um, what is something that you would want people watching this to know about those of us who had abortions and, and why you're sharing your story today? I think it's such a gray area and that everybody, everybody's just living their life doing the best that they can. And we have to understand that we can't foresee every situation. We can't legislate based on assumptions that aren't true and I feel like my story can reach people who maybe don't understand how complicated this issue really is and that we can't know all of the possibilities out there and hopefully we can learn to understand that and and legislate based on uncertainty and instead of gross untruths <laughs> Perhaps. Absolutely. Thank you Thank again you so, much. so much for sharing your story.